Hey there, hustlers. Buckle up for another episode of the Hemlane Hustle. Today's star guest is none other than Dustin Heiner, the real estate wizard who pulled off the ultimate escape act by quitting his job at 37. He now enjoys financial freedom and rakes in the big bucks from real estate. Not only that, but Dustin's also the mastermind behind the Real Estate Wealth Builders Conference. And for those of you who have not attended, I've been to it and can personally attest that anyone who is looking to build a career or become financially freedom through real estate should join. He gathers thousands of real estate fanatics to mix, uh, mingle, swap tips, and level up their investment game during this annual event. So give a welcome to the founder of Massive Pastor in Master of Passive Income and the Real Estate Wealth Builders Conference, the one and only Dustin. Dustin, welcome to this show. Hey, Dana, thank you so much for having me. I really, really appreciate you having me on the show. Yeah, I love real estate investing and that's, I quit my job, became, and I love the term successfully unemployed because of real estate investing. So I love what it affords me to do in my life. But then, like you said, you know, being able to make money. And now my new goal is to help 1 million people to invest in real estate, to change their life and hopefully become financially independent. So I really appreciate you having me on. I just love talking about real estate. And you and I hung out at RubeCon, uh, the Real Estate Wealth Builder Conference for a little bit, got to talk a little bit about real estate. So I'm so glad to be able to talk to number one, a real estate investor, but number two, another podcaster. Those are really fun combinations. <laughs> Great. And I love that goal, 1 million people to invest in real estate, because if you think about it, there's 19 million landlords out there, big and small, there's 19 million. So if you add another million, I think what that does to affordability, the affordability crisis, and also what it does to these people's lives is incredible. Um, so let's start, let's go backwards. I want to talk about those 1 million people how you're getting to them, some success stories you may have from that. But before we do, I really want to jump into your story. Um, how did you s get started in investing? And I know that you quit your job at 37, but when did you start investing in real estate? Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, I definitely didn't start investing in real estate. My family, we'd never invested in real estate. We we're just regular everyday people like, like most people, like we just work a job. So for me, it started with I've always been entrepreneurial in my life, you know, starting businesses, that type of idea. And so I had a graphic website design company, had a skateboard manufacturing business, even had a pizzeria and a convenience store, started from the scratch, um, ground up. But I was always taught and was following this path that I've been taught, everybody's taught this, you go to school, you get good grades, and then you take those good grades and you go to college or university and you hopefully get a degree and then you shop around to other businesses and hopefully get a career working there. So I'm doing the exact same thing. And then on top of that, you're supposed to work 40 plus years of your life and then retire at well, what 65, 70 years old, and hopefully live on 40% of what you saved the entire time working that J-O-B is what I call it. You're living just over broke. So it's a just over broke job. <laughs> and so I'm doing that exact same thing. And I get the most stable, secure job I could ever think of. It's working for the local county government in California doing technology. And we know California is not going away. Government's definitely not going away. And technology is not going away. So stable and secure. But at the same time, I bought one rental property. It was like 2006 when I first started investing. I bought one rental property and that property made me money without even working. It was so amazing that I knew- And time out. How did you, sorry to interrupt there, but I have to ask, how did you get the money to buy that first property? Was that just your savings um, or or what to actually like jump in? And <laughs> yeah. then also I have another question on that um, is like how, I mean, you have kids. I don't know if you have had kids then, but it's a lot of work to actually find a property and invest in it. So walk us through a little bit of that. And then I, I want you to keep going. Yeah, so- Funny enough, the reason why I laughed was when you asked my savings. No, I did not have savings. I was not even taught to have savings. I was taught not to go into debt, which is good. But my wife was taught to save. So we just got married. And I asked my wife, I said, hey, honey, can I take the money that you saved? She's like, I don't know, $15,000 or something like that. Can I take the money you saved and go buy an investment property in Ohio, of all places, like completely far away? And that took a lot of work to convince her to because I'd never done it before. I had no clue. Now, in order to do that, to buy my first property, 
I had to try to figure out how to do this. But in the process of doing this, I went and if you, if you remember back in 2000, they, they still have these now, but I was watching TV late at night, a late night infomercial came on. These gurus, quote unquote, real estate gurus said, hey, we're coming to your town, free two hour seminar, to teach you how to invest in real estate. So I was so excited. I had no clue how to do any of it. So I go to this two hour seminar and it's horrible. It's all hype and all sales pitch. And they say, run to the back. It's normally a million dollars, but it's a thousand dollars today. So I did that. I said, yay, I ran to the back and I spent the thousand dollars. I went to this two-day seminar that they had. That was even more hype and sales pitch for their $50,000 course, their $80,000 course. It, it was all a way to make money for them. And I didn't have money. So I didn't do that. But what I did was I said, you know what? I bet there's got to be a way to figure out how to do this myself. And through the uh, School of Hard Knocks, I bought my first property in Ohio using my wife's money, but I did it the wrong way. And I did it the way that the quote unquote gurus tell you to do it. And I'll get into that in just a second. Let me quickly get back to the idea of with kids and how I started investing. So my wife and I started having kids and we had our first child. I bought our first property and I had my businesses. I was running, working for the local county government as well. And you know what, Dana, I knew I needed to be an investor, but life started getting in the way. I started, we started having more and more kids. We have four kids now, now praise the Lord. We now have our fifth child. We have five kids now. But at the time when I had my fourth child, I was working the same desk, desk job and life got in the way. So I stopped investing and I just kept working that daily, you know, mm -hmm. grind. Well, on a Friday and I'm sitting at my work and I just come back for paternity leave. My wife had a child. That's where, you know, dad stays home with the mom, changes poopy diapers and all that good stuff. Well, I get back two weeks later and on a Friday at 3.30 in the afternoon, I get a call from my boss's 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 secretary, like the top dog. And she says, Dustin, would you please come to the office? I said, sure. And I hung up the phone. I paused for a second. I thought, why in the world are they calling me the office? Like this isn't normal. And I've seen plenty of movies. Friday at 3.30 is not a good time to be called to your boss's office. Well, I started thinking about potentially getting laid off because there were some rumors a couple of weeks mm -hmm. before I went off, be that there, this was 2009 or 10, like when there was a lot of problems in the economy. And so there were rumors that were potentially be layoffs. I immediately shook it off because I've been working there 14, 15 years. I got great seniority. Everything's going great for me. So I get up and I walk down the hallway to my boss's office. Now, Dana's hallway isn't very long. In fact, it's kind of short, but every single step that I take, it feels like my feet become lead bricks because the potential thought or the thought of potential to lose my job was starting to crush down on me. Well, I get down the hallway and I turn the corner and I see my boss's door. His door is closed and I see a secretary there, super sweet, nice old lady. And she says, Dustin, would you please have a seat? So I go and I sit down and she's sheepishly grinning at me, trying to console me with her eyes because she knows everything about what's going on. I know nothing about what's going on. So I go and I sit down and I think about my life. This whole time, doing that entire path that we're told to eventually retire at 65 years old, if I get laid off right now, I start thinking, did I just waste my life doing this? And oh my goodness, if I don't have money coming in from my job, does that make me a failure as a father? Does that make me a failure mm -hmm. as a husband, man, trying to provide for my family because we're not going to be able to do that? Well, as I'm sitting there, my hands get all clammy. My forehead gets all sweaty because the nerves are just crushing me. Well, the door to my boss's office uh, opens up and a coworker walks out with a piece of paper in her hands. She's noticeably distraught, noticeably upset. She's not necessarily crying, but you could tell her world has been rocked. She passes by me and my boss says, Dustin, would you please come to the office? So I get up and I go in the office and I get laid off. And remember, this is the government. Oh. Nobody gets fired or laid off from the government, but I did. And this yeah. is the reason why I tell this story. So I take that layoff notice and I go and I sit down at my desk, just getting laid off. And I realize two things. The first thing is I need to get another job. I need to find a way to provide for myself and my family. So really blessed, praise the Lord, to find another job in the same county, a different department, wasn't having the money issues. Check, got that. But the second thing, this is the reason why I tell the story. I realized that I need to make sure that this never, ever happens to me again. I need to make sure that nobody has the mm -hmm. ability to take away my ability to feed my family. So right then and there, I started telling everybody that I am an investor. Now, it may so happen that 100% of my money comes from my job. That's now my part-time job. I am a full-time investor. Because whenever we get asked the question, what do you do? I would reply, my job. Oh, I work for the county doing IT. Well, 
that is projecting out to the world that I put the value in myself as coming from my job. No, my value doesn't come from my job. My value comes from my God, from myself and from my family. So I started telling every single person that I'm an investor and fast forward the story. I started buying property after property after property, each one making me a minimum of $250 a month in passive income. Some are making me five, six, seven, $800 a month in passive income. Eventually, last part of the story, I went to my new boss, great boss and all, went to new boss and I say, hey boss, I'm laying you off, you know, jokingly. And we laughed and he said, well, what are you gonna do? I said, I don't have to do anything. I own real estate that makes money for me without even working. So the last part of the story, I walked away from my job the very last time. I walked to and from my work a mile and a half every single day because I'm too frugal to pay for parking. It was downtown. Well, I felt like I was walking on clouds because I knew I would never, ever need another job again, as opposed to walking out the hallway, getting laid off. My feet became lead bricks. Well, I knew yeah. I was going to walk on my clouds because- I would never need a job again. So everybody listening, the last thing I'll say is, I want you to realize your boss will never be able to pay you what you are worth because this is how you'll know. Your boss is paying you just enough to keep you working without quitting, but not so much where that takes money out of their pocket. If they paid you what you were worth, they would go broke. So nobody will ever pay you what you're worth. So instead, my suggestion is find a way to make passive income. That's why I love the brand master passive income so that you can get passive income so that you don't actually have to work a job and have somebody be able to pull out the rug from under you. So I'll pause the story because you probably got pretty questions on how I build the properties, 30 plus properties and all that good stuff. Yeah, I've got so many questions for you. Um, first, I want to talk about financing. Then I want to talk about types of businesses and real estate versus others. Um, the first one is on the financing. So you have four kids. I have two kids. Two kids are very, very expensive. Now you have five, but at this point you had four kids. So they're double as expensive as my children. My children are very expensive. Um, so how could you get to 30 with four kids and a government job? Like how did you make that work and still get 250 to $500 per rental property? Um, how the heck did you do that? Yeah, yeah. So. And every investor gets into this mindset because it's the first thing that we think of. We need to find a mortgage broker and find a realtor and put them together and buy a property. Well, that's one way to do it. And when you get a mortgage, you have to get a down payment, which costs a lot of money, all that sort of stuff. Well, mm -hmm. I literally found 15 different ways to get financing. I used 15 different ways. I'll quickly go over just a couple of them. And when you use creative financing, that's what I like to call it, or it's called creative financing. Instead of just getting a mortgage, you know, save up a lot of money, put a huge down payment down, buy a house. That's just one way. In fact, it's the least efficient way. What I love to do is utilize creative financing, but other people's money. So let me, well, I literally give 15 different ways that I invest in real estate or get financing. So we'll quickly go through them. Uh, number one, obviously, if you have cash, but it doesn't have to be your cash, you can use private money. I use lots of private money. I've used hard money lenders. I've even used signature loans. That's where you go into a bank and literally say, can you give me a loan just by me signing my signature? And they give you a loan. I've used um, uh, bundled loans portfolio loans, commercial loans, DSCR loans, debt service coverage ratio loans. I have even used um, the credit card that had a cash advance to buy properties. And here's, and there's a couple more, there's, sorry, there's a lot more seller financing subject to, I've done all these ways to get deals because I've been able to use creative financing because I understand how to make sure that the seller gets what they want. And then I get what I want. But here's the biggest thing, Dana. In all these financing, when somebody says, well, Dustin, you used a credit card to buy credit to you know, buy a house? I said, yes, it was very expensive. Same thing like hard money is very expensive. But here's the great thing about real estate investing. I don't pay my mortgage on any of my properties. I don't pay my taxes. I don't pay my insurance. I don't pay for property management. I don't even pay for repairs. My tenants pay for all of that. And I account for that before I buy the property those are called expenses. And then I make sure I make mm -hmm. a minimum. Remember, this is a minimum. I make a lot more in a lot of my properties. Some are $1,000 a month in passive income, but a minimum of $250 a month. So when I do that, I make sure that I can account for the expense of my interest or credit card payment or whatever it is. Because imagine this, last thing, because I know you have a couple of questions that I, I wanted to get have you jump in. So think of this. If you're going to start a business where you have a candy bar, and you can buy the candy bar for 50 cents 
and you knew every day, all day, you could sell it for a dollar. Well, you would love to get as many candy bars, 50 cents, pay it out as much as possible. But the great thing about real estate investing, you would be able to borrow money. Let's say you'd even have 50 cents. Well, you can borrow that 50 cents, maybe cost you 25 cents, but it doesn't matter that it costs 25 cents because you're selling it for a dollar. You're still making 25 cents from every single transaction. You'll think, how can I borrow more money? Same thing with real estate investing. It's a business that you need to build that makes you money every single month. So that interest, all those fees, everything is accounted for and it's paid for by the tenant. You would not buy a candy bar for 50 cents if you could only sell it for 25 cents. You'll be losing money. So just like in real estate, you have a business. Now our business owns inventory and our property is our inventory. So hopefully that helps you understand we use all types of ways to get financing. And we make sure that the financing can be paid, paid for by our tenants. I love it. Um, and yes, I do have some questions on it, especially in today's market. I love the big um, candy bar uh, uh, parallel there uh, story. Um, but my biggest question is, can you still do that today? So I think, you know, with some of these uh, hard money loans or however you're thinking about it, a bank. They're going to give you, hey, it's like a 12% interest rate. And you can barely, if you look at properties across the nation, I always tell people like two to three years ago, I put them on my pro forma and I, it, it compares them all. They each have a tab and then the tabs sync to my main tab and it compares every single property. And then, you know, everything's in green or red based on cap rates and how well your cash flow is every month and year. And everything used to be green. No matter what property I chose, it was green. Um, basically, you can purchase any of these real estate for dummies, and like you'll still do well. Now, within with um, interest rates, um, and, and I put it into there, and every single one is usually red. And I have to find that diamond in the rough in order to like purchase it because it's so hard when you have interest rates you know, the models, you'll have it at 7% or whatever interest rate you're getting at that moment. So then I have to assume if you're putting another loan on top of that, that's higher than the interest rates of a traditional mortgage. How do you get the numbers to work? And how do you find those properties today when money isn't as free as it used to be? I would say even much more so today, as opposed to even two or three years ago, you need to implement everything I've just been talking about from getting creative financing. Now, how you get the cash flow up, it's really simple. Because you have more expenses in a mortgage or a hard money lender, you have more expenses coming out of your pocket. The only way to do that is to make sure you get the price of the property down. You get the price mm -hmm. of the property down, you have less of a mortgage payment or hard money payment or whatever it might be. So you have more cash flow. Now, how you do this, this is... Actually, this is this spans the top across any type of market. So the way I invest in real estate, I make sure I make money if the market goes up, if the market goes down, or if the market goes sideways. I make sure I'm always making money. Let me give you an example of what it looks like. So if you're going to start a convenience store, you know, a convenience store, candy bars, soda machines, all the good stuff. Yeah. Well, more candy bars. Not... <laughs> exactly. More candy bars. I love the analogy. So <laughs> you would not sign a lease on a location, open the doors and set a box of candy bars in there on the ground to sell. No, you go out of business in two seconds, but what you would do is you would build the business first. You get the gondolas, those are the shelving units that all the candy bars go on, the countertops, cold storage, bank accounts, cash registers, employees, insurance, everything in the business before you buy any inventory. Then once the business is built, then you get the inventory in the business. Same thing with real estate investing. You build the entire business and then you buy that piece of inventory. The inventory is the last step of the business model. Now, the reason why I express this to answer your question, in order to do this business right, we need experts. No, I'm not an expert. I don't wanna be an expert. In fact, I invest in five different states, I think. I've got hotels, I've got apartment complexes, I've got 30 plus properties. I have so many different things that I'm doing but I'm not the expert in any of those markets. I might know a little bit, but I'm not the expert. In fact, I have students. I coach a lot of people out invest in real estate. And a student will say, hey, Dustin, you invest in this particular city. You're the expert. Tell me about it. I say, no, 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 no. I'm not the expert. Even though I invest there, I hire 
the experts to tell me what to do right. So to help you to understand how to buy the price or the property lower in price, here's what we do. We build the entire business that have the experts, the right property managers, contractors, inspectors, wholesalers, um, uh, plumbers. Like You get everybody in the business before we buy the property. Now, what that really looks like is if I'm going to buy a property, well, let me tell it this way. So I've had many people call me and say, hey, Dustin, I have this property. I did everything those quote unquote gurus told me to do. So I found a property in the country that I can invest and I could get hopefully get appreciation, which I don't invest for appreciation at all. That's icing on the cake. I will literally mm -hmm. give these properties to my kids. You can see them in the background if you're watching on YouTube, but I will literally give these properties to my kids. I invest for cash flow. So what we do is we build the entire business to make sure that it makes us money. But somebody would call me up and say, Dustin, I bought this property, spent thousands of dollars to fix up the property, thousands of dollars, obviously to buy a property. Then I got a tenant and then I tried to find a property manager and all the property managers would tell me, no, I will not manage the property because I'll get shot there. Well, then yes. a bad, it's no longer an asset, it's a liability. How much better if you hire experts, the realtors, the wholesalers, like the inspectors, you get all the right people where you call them up. Let's say you talk to a property management company like Hemline, you call them up, you say, hey, I'm looking at this area or I'm looking at that. Or you talk to a realtor and say, hey, realtor, is this a good or bad area? Instead of after, hey, I already bought this property. Tell me about it. No, yeah. no, no. You do everything before you buy the property and they, the experts, will tell you if it's a good area, how much it'll rent for, what type of clientele you have, what's the vacancy factor, all that good stuff so that you know before you buy the property. You don't waste your time, energy, and money mm -hmm. buying a bad property that's now a liability. So getting back to your answer of how do we make sure we get that cash flow? How do we make sure that we're making money, especially in this environment? even much more so. It's so much more important now because there's so many properties out there that you can buy for really, really cheap, but they're not going to make you money because they're bad areas that you're going to have a hard time getting property managers. What I love to do with all my students, we teach them, make sure that we find the experts in the city to make sure that we're buying the right property. So when you get a realtor, that realtor is going to help you. Hopefully if they're a good realtor, they're going to help mm -hmm. you to get the price down especially wholesalers. I love working with wholesalers. They get the price down. And then I talk to them, hopefully negotiate the price down a little bit more. But if it fits my business model where I make money and passive income, then I will buy the property. If I don't, then I'll move on because there are so many properties out there. But that's how you make sure you're making money and passive income. You hire the experts. They're going to make sure you buy the right properties and stay away from the wrong properties. Does that all make sense? I love it. I couldn't agree more with that of having the right experts because I always see folks try to do it themselves and there's some major mistakes they make. Everything from like plumbing to what you had mentioned of finding the right property to like property management and free leases online. That's like, no, please don't do that. I, I definitely see those mistakes. Um, how do you find the wholesalers? Oh, I love that question because most people think they're hard to find. They're actually, they, they want to be found. Don't get me wrong. They love being found because that's how they make their money. So if anybody doesn't know what a wholesaler is, they find buyers and sellers and put them together. That's They're basically like a realtor, but work so much harder than realtors and they make money. Now, here's how I love to find realtors, or sorry, brothers, wholesalers. And I'll tell you how I do it from out of state. I love doing this from out of state. Now, if you're in the city that you're trying to invest, you want to find wholesalers, it's easy enough. All you literally do is drive around your neighborhood, neighborhoods that you want to invest in, and look for those signs that say, we buy houses fast or we buy houses for cash. Those are wholesalers. Call them up and say, hey, hey, coal seller, I want you to put me on your buyers list. Like, please. Okay, absolutely. They are excited to have buyers. So that's number one. If you're in that city, then do that. But here's a great way if you want to find wholesalers outside in a city that you don't even want to go visit. Like I invest in, I want to say it's at least seven or eight different cities and you know, five different States. I never want to visit it. That's not even something on my mind is to go visit, it. but yeah. I need to find the right people. Here's how you do it. Think of how are wholesalers going to electronically through the internet, find sellers and buyers. So go on Craigslist or Facebook or go to any place that has um, a listing, like a, like a, a listing service type in, the same thing that they would probably want to put out. We buy houses cash. So if you go on Craigslist or Facebook 
and you type that search in there, those people that are saying we'll buy houses, those are wholesalers. You're going to find lots and lots of wholesalers. Now, if they're good or not, I don't know, but you're going to find lots and lots of them. So, so easy to find wholesalers. They want you to work with them. How do you know you're working with a good wholesaler? Because on the realtor side, it's very similar. Um, you know, you want someone who's worked with investors, who understands the rental rates in the market, all of that, um, the neighborhoods that have that balance of cash flow, but also like good quality tenants because the cash flow will change significantly if you have to go through evictions. How do you figure out and trust those wholesalers? Because I think you're right. There's a lot of this, especially in real estate, what I've learned is there's a, there's a lot of sketchy people in it. For some reason, it attracts um, quite a few uh, corrupt individuals. Especially and wholesaling, will have yes. This, yes, and they have this get rich quick mentality. And so you really need a track record. And often when someone is really bad, people just don't review them online. Wholesalers, it's hard to find reviews and stuff online. So you really don't know who you're dealing with. And even if you ask them for reviews, they may give, you know, Aunt Betty as a review, um, even though there's 50 p investors they've worked with who would never work with them again. So I'm going to make a lot of realtors mad. I'm definitely going to make them mad. I'll probably make wholesalers mad. So here is my answer to that. I do not care if the wholesaler is reputable or not. I do not care if a realtor is reputable. Or not. Here's the reason why. Number one, I don't care about a realtor's reputation. I only care about the deal. I don't care about the wholesaler's reputation. I only care about the deal. Now, here's what it boils down for me. I make sure that I have good inspectors. I have good property managers. <laughs> I have uh, contractors, plumbers, roofers. I, I have everybody else that's going to verify the deal. So I tell all my students, and this is the fun thing. When students find a new city to invest in, they say, Dustin, I found a great city to invest in. I already have five realtors setting me deals. I'm like, no, no, stop, stop, stop. Okay, if you bought a property, who would manage that property? They say, uh, I don't know. I say, good, okay, now you're Hamlet. starting to realize. <laughs> yes, exactly, exactly, we'll be using Hamlin. You realize the track or the, the train of thought now is wholesalers and realtors are the last step of the entire process of building your business. I always talk about building your business. They're literally the last step because like I said, the inventory, that's the last step. Now, what I do though, is I find great companies to work with. that are going to verify the deal. And the reason why I say realtors and wholesalers are going to be mad at me. I do not work with any particular realtor. I don't care if they're a, uh, investor type realtor. I don't care if they're, you know, a mom and pop. If it's the deal that works for me, I'm going to use them. A lot of realtors might say, well, you got to work with one realtor and just stay with them. Like, no, you want me to do that. Well, how about, because I, oh, this is funny. I've had realtors say, hey, Dustin, how about you sign an exclusivity with me where I, me as an investor will only be able to buy through them. I said, well, that's interesting. Let's do it the other way. Let's say you get any listing at all as a realtor, you only can sell it to me. They would say, no, why would I do that? It's like, exactly. Why would I yeah. use you as a realtor to only buy through you? It's only benefiting you. So here's what I, I do. I have wholesalers finding me deals. I have realtors, other investors, property managers, even title companies have sent me deals. I remember at the beginning, I said, I started telling everybody that I'm an investor. Now everybody knows me as an investor. So deals come to me without even me looking for them because they know me as an investor. So that's my way to say, I love realtors, love wholesalers, but I'm not going to worry about using them unless they send me a deal. And then I only worry about the deal, not worry about the person. Yeah, I love that. I think that's uh, fantastic. And having multiple sources to verify everything. Verify, absolutely. Um, real estate, you've built up your portfolio. Um, how did you think about that as your business um, versus anything else that you could do? Was it that it was stable, steady? How did you kind of think about when you had, when you got laid off and you said, hey, I'm going to get another job, but I want to make sure that I'm not dependent on this job for, you know, taking care of my family, my five kids, et cetera. Um, how did you think about from that perspective, real estate being better than any other business that you could build? So I tried lots of business and I love this question because everybody that's trying to reach financial freedom, it's a really hard thing to get. It's it's the longest time to get there because you don't really know what's going to work. Now, some other mm -hmm. people, instead of doing real estate, 
let's say they did something online, maybe they sell courses or write books, or, and then that's how I get financial freedom. Financial freedom, is a, it's a long road to get there. But when you get there, that's just the start. Getting to financial freedom is a start. Now, for me, I was literally, just like most people, throwing everything at the wall, see what would stick. Literally, like, you know, starting many businesses, like I said, a graphic website design company, skateboard manufacturing business, convenience store. Um, I, I also obviously had a job, plus I started investing in real estate. I had a couple other businesses in there and, you know, selling things on eBay, like tr just trying everything possible. But here's what really set me over the edge and knowing that real estate is the only way to go. It was when I bought my first rental property and that check came in from my property manager. I remember this dollar amount plain as day. I was like, is it was so amazing. I looked at the check. It was $317. I will never forget this first. This is the very first check. Now it just comes off, you see, electronically. This is 2006 when I first started buying. $317 from this first property that I made in profit. I was like, whoa, my goodness. This I didn't do anything. I did all this work one time. That's why I love the brand, Master Passive Income. That's why I created it. When I bought one property, it made me money without working. And I hired experts to do the work for me. I've mastered passive incomes. I didn't literally have to do anything else. That's why I created the, the podcast and everything, Master Passive Income. I want to show people how to master passive income. So when I realized all these other businesses took so much work, so much headache and babysitting of employees, as well as a lot of money out of my pocket with inventory and overhead, and all that sort of stuff, that this other business that I created with investing in real estate it took so much less time. I did work one time and the property makes money for me over and over again. I realized it was the easiest money that I could make. And here's another great thing. All those combined is on top of that, you make money. And I know Dana, you know this, but I'll share this for everybody that they, they need to hear this too. When you buy one rental property, you make money in six different ways. And I'll quickly go through those. Number one's passive income. You make sure you count your expenses. You rent it for more than, it's, than your expenses. And that money is your passive income. I suggest a minimum of $250. My suggestion, you could get to a thousand. I have properties making me a thousand dollars. So that's number one, passive income. Second one is equity capture. We buy the property and we buy it for less than it's worth because we're investors. In fact, I just bought a, a short-term property. It was going for four hundred. $50,000, I bought it for 420. So I basically captured $30,000 in equity right when I bought the property. Plus I'll be making a lot of money in passive income. That's number two. Number three is forced appreciation. As soon as you buy the property, you fix it up. You make it worth more by putting more money into it. So what you do is you actually put in, let's say $10,000 and it will increase the value of the home by 20, 25, even 30 plus thousand dollars. So you force the appreciation, force the value up. Another one, we just know over time, market appreciation, just over time market goes up. In fact, it's it's said that every 15 to 20 years, the value of homes double, which sounds amazing, but that's literally what happens. Another one is mortgage buy down. I love this. Remember how I said, I don't pay my mortgage. I don't pay my interest. I don't pay my principal. I don't pay any of that stuff. My tenants pay for my mortgage. So every yeah. time I make a mortgage payment, now the money goes into me and I pay out these bills, but I don't have to get a job for this. Now my mortgage gets lower and lower. Let me give you a quick example. Let's say I bought a house for $200,000 and then I put a tenant in there. And if I use it as, you know, put 10% 10, 10 down, that might be, let's say $40,000 that comes out of my pocket, which that's just one way. In fact, I have lots of ways to buy with no money down, which we can get into a lot later. But the rest of that balance, the principal and the interest will be paid for by my tenant. So they pay down the rest of the property. The last one is tax benefits. And I kid you not, if you're just getting started, you're gonna look at depreciation as like, okay, depreciation is nice. No, 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 depreciation is not just nice. It's amazing. When you start making a lot of money, it helps you to get out of paying Uncle Sam. Like quick, quick, one, quick last thing. I was gonna pay Uncle Sam a lot of money. I called my accountant in November. I said, hey, how much money am I gonna be paying to the government? He says, a lot of money. I said, well, crap, what am I supposed to do? He says, well, go buy a truck. Go buy a truck because you get depreciation because you're a real estate professional. Go buy a truck that's over 6,000 pounds. You're going to get a huge tax write-off. So instead of paying the government, well, I bought the truck for $50,000. It saved me $30,000 in taxes. So I basically bought a $50,000 truck for 20 grand. So all that to say, these six ways, passive income, equity capture, forced depreciation, market depreciation, mortgage buy-down, and tax benefits. That on top of making the money that I, I didn't have to do work, but one time made me realize I am all in with this real estate investing. I love it because I, you're right. Folks only look at that, like 
oh, I'm getting $300, but they forget literally someone is paying your mortgage for you. And that is also increasing over time. You can 1031 exchange it, so many things. Um, Dustin, this was so insightful. Are you ready for a lightning round? Yes, let's do it. Biggest mistake you made in your real estate investing career? Easy, not building the business first. My property manager, remember, I follow those quote unquote gurus, listened to the mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know infomercial, went to the seminar. I followed their step by step process, found a property manager after doing everything but the property, and my property manager started stealing from me within six months because I had no clue what I was doing. But what I realized yeah. was, and I kind of thought, man, maybe I should give up. Maybe this doesn't work. But I knew it worked. It had to work because people were doing it. I just had to figure out a way to do it. And being entrepreneurial, I said, let me approach this from a business mindset. Instead of jumping right to a property, I said, let's build a business. So for anybody listening, the number one thing you need to do is build the business that has experts doing it for me. And the second quick thing I'll just throw in there, make sure you're making money in passive income every single month. Don't hope for appreciation. Appreciation is icing mm -hmm. on the cake. Like I said, I will literally give these properties to my kids in generational wealth so that they will have these properties. Plus, I'm obviously educating them as well to buy their own. Yeah, that's awesome. Uh, quotes you live by and why? Biggest one is, when is the best time to plant a tree? Well, it was 20 years ago. The next best time is literally today. So if you're thinking right now, Think of yourself 20 years from now, listening to um, the Hemlane podcast, listening to Dana and myself. 20 years from now, you might be thinking, man, I really wish I would have bought real estate. It was really high back then, but look how high it is now. I wish I would have done it back then. You do not want to be sitting 20 years from now thinking, I wish I would have done that. No, instead, 20 years from now, you want to be thinking, I'm so glad I listened to Dana. I'm so glad I listened, started using Hemline. I started building my business. Now I'm financially free. I have the ability to give these properties to my kids. That is by far one of the, this is what really grabbed me back, I don't know, 15, 20 years ago when I first started investing. I said, I want to look back 20 years from now saying, I'm so glad I planted that investing tree back then. I love it. Um, when are you investing next and where are you investing? I just bought in Tennessee just a month ago, closed on a short-term rental property. Like I said, bought it for $420,000. It's probably going to be passive, passive income or cash flowing about $2,200, $2,300 a month in passive income because it's a short-term rental. And even if I needed to long-term rent it, I could make maybe a couple hundred dollars a month in passive income. So it's a great property. On top of that, I'm so bought into Tennessee right now in the same area, about a mile and a half away. I just bought a 355 unit apartment complex. Fantastic apartment complex. We bought it for 60 cents on the dollar because the, the previous owner was having trouble on another project. They needed money. They sold it to us. Tremendous. So I love Tennessee right now, but that's not, that's just one state. I literally invest in Ohio, Texas, Arizona, Tennessee, um, Indiana, and Missouri. I think there's one other one I can't remember off the top of my head. But the greatest thing about investing is everything is local. A lot of people, like realtors, will say location, location, location. It's not that. They're wrong. Everything is local. Every type of real estate is local. So I'm personally continuing to buy in Tennessee, but my students are buying all over the country. I love it. Um, you mentioned a course you took, which was not great from the gurus. So my understanding is you made a free course um, for Hemling, um, uh, Hemling listeners. Where can our listeners go to um, learn from your free course? Absolutely. Yeah, I was, well, my mission now is to help 1 million people to invest because I don't I don't need the money. They, I make money money through real estate. And so I love it. I will literally give everybody, show you how to find an area in the country, anywhere to invest, how to build a business, how to scale the business to become financially free or successfully unemployed, like I like to call it. So if you text the word rental, R-E-N-T-A-L, rental to 33777, rental to 33777, I'll literally give you this course. Or you can go to Master Passive Income dot com forward slash free course master passive income dot com forward slash free course i'll literally give it to you plus i even have my free podcast i literally it's like 90 percent is literally me since 2015 teaching how to invest in real estate the way that i do it and the way my students do it master passive income podcast you can find me on there plus you can also reach out to me on instagram um i i'm not that arrogant but i had to come up with a, a handle it's the dustin heiner t-h-e Dustin Heiner. You can find me on there. I love connecting with people. So it's just my way to help people because I found Dana and you're the same way. I know you're the same way. The more people that I help in this life and serve in this life, 
the better my life gets, the better their life gets. And it's just a win-win all around. I love it, Dustin. Well, thank you so much. I hope the listeners, I know they learned so much um, from this show. So thanks so much for uh, being on the show and we'll see you for the next one. Thank you, Dana.